Welcome to Train Signal. You are watching using host profiles. So let's talk a little bit about what host profiles do. The idea is it eliminates per host vSphere configuration. So you're going to get kind of a gold image, if you will, or a master config, from usually from another host within your cluster. So you're going to set him up just like you want him. And then you're going to kind of snapshot that config, create a profile, and then you can push that down to your other host. Now obviously you can't do everything, but you can do most things, and we'll talk about how you customize the rest. It does require Enterprise Plus licensing, uh, that's just VMware for you, so you know not a lot I can do for you there, but uh, it is a nice feature, especially when we talk about auto-deploy and things like that, it's going to make your life a lot easier. It also allows you to detect if a host has been changed, so you can do what we call a compliance check. Uh, maybe somebody created a new uh, local port group and didn't get pushed to the other systems. We can see that. Or some sort of a standard change, say a pathing change uh, for multi-pathing or something like that. We can check and see if those have been changed as well. So it's pretty handy for both checking compliance and enforcing a standardized configuration. It's made up of a number of sub-profiles. So you'll see this term used especially in the VCAP blueprint. And the idea, I mean, it's, it's real simple. Uh, when we go in and edit a profile, you'll see these. So you'll see these sub-profiles, and you can edit them and change them. You can even delete them. You may not want to have some config items within the overall profile that get pushed down, so you can delete those. But just understand that a sub-profile is basically one of the sub-trees within the overall host profile. Steps to create these are pretty simple. One, you're going to configure your reference host. Um, you're going to do this for the first one. You do have an option to export out host profiles and import them into, say, other vCenters, but at some point you're probably going to build this off of a reference host. Next, you're going to create the profile using the Create Profile Wizard in vCenter. Uh, real simple, all you're going to do is point it at the host and say, give me that guy's config and give it a name and a bit of a description, and it'll go ahead and create the host profile. Then you attach either one or more hosts or one or more clusters to the profile. I guess the correct terminology is you attach the profile to the host or cluster, but either way. So yes, you can do a cluster, or for testing you can do an individual host. It's really up to you. If you do a cluster, it just rolls through and adds each host inside the cluster. Uh, so whatever makes your life easier. And then you can do compliance checks against the individual host or the overall cluster or whatever you want to do. Create and modify host answer files if required. It's basically they're always required. But what an answer file is, it's an answer to the unique attributes of a server. For example, IP addresses for VM kernel interfaces. I don't want to use the same IP across all of my hosts, obviously. So I have to create an answer file. Answer files are real simple. You right click on a host and you say update answer file. And it goes through and figures out, all right, let me look at the config or the host profile. All right, I need some custom information here, here, and here and it'll prompt you for those. So you don't have to dig through the whole thing looking for them. It will go ahead and pull out what it needs. So that's pretty pretty slick and it uh, makes your life easier. And again, we're going to talk about these again when we talk about auto-deploy. So as we do stateless ESXi hosts, we need to push down a config and we need to push down the unique information for those and those come out of the answer files. And then you check the new host uh, compliance with the host profile. And odds are you're going to be missing some things. Maybe not, um, but odds are there'll be one or two things that you need to fix, and it lists those out. And then you can apply the needed changes to bring it into compliance, and I think I just said, but it will list out all the changes it's going to make and tell you what's going to happen before it does that. And it'll even tell you if it needs to put it in maintenance mode or it needs to reboot the host, and it'll walk you through all that. So I just talked about answer files, but many settings are not the same across all hosts, such as your IP addresses, and you create these on a per host basis. And again, we'll do it when we get to auto-deploy, but it kind of fills that gap over what host profiles can normally do. So host profiles can push down almost anything. NFS configurations, virtual networking, they can even uh, push down a distributed switch config. So if you have, say, your, your reference host is part of a, a distributed switch, and it's got such and such NICs as part of the uplink groups, it will even push that down. So it's a great way to push down your networking as well. But again, for these last few things, we do answer files. 
they are created automatically, but you obviously manually answer specific things. So I, I talked about this. We do an update answer file, and then it's going to run through, figure out what you need to answer, and prompt you for it. If you want to share host profiles, you can. Real simple. You just export them from vCenter. They're saved in what's called a VPF format. Um, you can open these in a text editor and look at them. Uh, I've done that to kind of, like, if I get an error on something, I can figure out where that's in the profile because sometimes there's so much stuff it's hard to find. So that's an option. You can then import that into another vCenter. It's a manual process, no synchronization, meaning once you import in the other vCenter, there, there are two separate configs. If you change it in one, there is no way to sync that change to the other without exporting it and re-importing it and then reattaching it on the destination vCenter. Some items are not exported, such as passwords. So it's not going to export those and even warns you about that when you do an export. So let's jump to the lab. So in the lab, we're going to create a new host profile, attach it to a cluster, we'll modify the answer files, check compliance, and then remediate any needed changes. So pretty much a standard run through of a host profile. So with that, let's go ahead and let's jump over to the lab. All right, so here we are in the lab. Let's take a look at what we're going to do with host profile. So what I'm going to do is take a host profile and use Optimus as my reference host. And then we're going to apply it to Bumblebee. And I've already got Bumblebee in uh, maintenance mode because before you remediate changes, it's required you put it in maintenance mode. So I thought I'd save us all the trouble of watching uh, VMotion a bunch of VMs off of it. So to get started, we can do this one of two ways. You can right-click on a host, go to Host Profiles, and then Create Profile from Host, Check Compliance, or Apply the Profile, which remediates changes. I like to do it, go back to Home, go to Management, Host Profiles, and do it within this interface. So I've already got one lab host profile created, and you can obviously have multiples. Uh, you may have multiple clusters or hosts of a different type, and you may need different profiles for the different server config, so it's up to you. Create host profile, and you can import an existing profile that you've exported elsewhere, or create one from an existing host, so we'll do that. Expand out, expand my cluster, and we'll choose Optimus. Then it wants us to do a name, so I'll do VCAP Demo Lab, and this is a demo for the description and finish. So it'll kick off a task and create your host profile. Now, once that's created, we will edit it, take a look at it, and we'll start applying it. If you want to export one, I'll show you this one here. Right click, export profile, and it'll say as a security measure, as we talked about, passwords are not exported, blah, blah, blah. Hit OK, and it'll dump it out to what we call VPF format, which is text. You can open it and you can look at it. And you can obviously, as we just saw, just import that guy right back in. So it looks like ours is done. So we'll click that. And we'll click Host and Clusters. It already did it for me, but you do that. So let's edit it first. So inside is a bunch of stuff. I wish there was a search function, because every now and then I have to go dig for something. And honestly, if you're digging for something because you're getting an error, like I'm about to show you on mine, uh, sometimes I'll export it to VPF, open it in WordPad, figure out where it is, and then go that way. For example, my Optimus host has uh, an advanced config option that my other hosts do not support, this one here, NetDB filter bind address, that will cause it to fail. So I'm going to remove that. So these are called sub-profiles. So you can edit, add, change these as you want to. There's a lot of stuff in here. So there's storage configurations such as NFS for my three different NFS data stores and you can edit those if you want to. You can say edit and it'll show you that. If you've ever mounted NFS data stores with varying names or addresses you know this can be useful because if I mount an NFS data store manually on one host using IP and the next host using the name it'll often see that as two separate data stores. So this is one way to make sure your configuration is absolutely correct. You can do things like pluggable storage architecture. We'll talk about claim rules in another lesson. But I created one on Optimus here, claim rule 300, with my Nash Corp array as, a, as an example. And it pulled that in, and that'll be pushed down to all the other hosts. You can do things like you can set native multipathing information. If you want to change the default path selection policy for one of your storage array type plugins, you can do it here. Again, push that to all your hosts and not have to do all those funky little commands that we talk about in that lesson. 
iSCSI, same information. Networking, standard V switches, uh, physical NIC configurations, that's another one. Let's see here. Physical NIC or VMNIC 4 is a 10 gig adapter that's in Optimus that is not in my other host, so I don't need that config because when I uh, do a compliance check, it's going to say, hey, VMNIC 4 does not exist on these hosts, and it won't be able to configure it, but it will throw a false compliant out of compliance warning, so we can delete that. Uh, IP route information, DNS information. Uh, I talked about quickly distributed switches in the slides. So Optimus is a member of Nash Lab BDS. He's got one of his ports uplinked uh, right there, and that would be VMNIC3. So as I apply this, it'll do the same to the other host. So it's a great way to do the same VDS configuration across your host. You can basically deploy a VDS like this. Create it, roll your reference host over to it like you want it, snapshot that as your reference, and then push that down to everyone else. So again, lots of information. I suggest you kind of look through it and at least have an idea of where everything's at. Uh, let's see. Also, keep in mind you can remove things if they're not needed, add things if they're needed. You know, it's just a way to kind of confirm changes. So I think that's everything I wanted to hit on here. I'll hit OK. And now we want to attach this. So we right-click, and we want to attach host cluster. You can also change your reference host. If you want to uh, refresh the policy or profile from the original reference host, you do that here. Just keep in mind, like those two things I just deleted, they will get re-added back in. So keep a log of everything that you remove or manually add and put that in there. So let us attach, and we'll just do it to the whole cluster. And then we'll do a compliance check. So my hosts are going to fail. Well, Optimus isn't going to fail because he's my reference host. All the other ones will, but we'll take a look at Bumblebee here in just a second. We kind of hit on answer files, so I'll give you a, a brief introduction before we actually do one. Uh, to create your answer file, you do update answer file. It looks through the host profile, figures out what needs unique information, and prompts you for it. You don't have to dig through all of that stuff and find it yourself. You just do update answer file. You can import them. You can export them. Uh, you can check them to make sure they're good and correct, whatever you want to do. Uh, but it will prompt us for that here in a minute, well, when we ask it to. I've actually already created answer files for some of these hosts before, but we'll walk through the process again. Let's give this one more second, and we should see some red and some green. And there we are. So obviously Optimus is good to go. Bumblebee, less so. So I removed two of Bumblebee's NFS data stores to show you how it would add those back. So data store 2 and data store 3 are no longer there. Uh, I also created a host profile on Optimus called Host Profile Demo that I did not create on Bumblebee. A couple of things here. These two uh, have to do with a local SATA device, and this is actually a false warning. VMware's got a KB article on this that they need to fix. You can actually go in there and remove some stuff so it doesn't throw these non-compliant errors on this. Same for this. Uh, IP version 4 routes did not match. They have a KB article open on that as well. Basically, it's saying host profiles has an issue if you have multiple VM kernel interfaces on the same IP subnet, which I do have in my lab, so that's a false warning as well. So I can't make all these things turn happy and green yet, but I just wanted to warn you about that. So that's the changes that are going to happen. So let's right-click and update our answer file. So let's create our answer file first. So it's going to parse through the whole profile and see what needs unique information. So give it a second. And since I've already created answer files before, some of these are going to be pre-populated, but you'll see them. So we only need a couple of things. Again, you can walk down. It's asking us for the MAC address for our management network, which it has pulled from the existing one, I believe. So it's got one there. IP uh, address, it's already got the existing one there as well. And it also wants to know over on the distributed switch, I have another VM kernel interface, and it wants to know IP of that, and it pulled the existing one there too. But don't be surprised if, say, I wasn't part of the DV switch, I haven't ever done an answer file, that these are blank and you have to key that information in. And it's obviously it's going to be host specific, so you want to make sure you match up the right information to the right host. All mine are good, so uh, actually host name, yep, it's even got Bumblebee, okay. And MAC address, good, so anything with a little paper on it you want to make sure you click. Update. So it'll update the answer file here. Once that's done, we'll go ahead and we will apply the profile. Done. So, a 
apply. Now we're going to go through. It's going to give us a list of all the things that it's going to change. And it's going to be similar to the list that we just saw, but instead of saying these are wrong, it's going to say this is what I'm going to do. All right. So it's going to mount the data stores, create a port group, and uh, try to fix this, which is not actually going to fix it, but it should not cause the problem. So go ahead and say, yeah, go do what you got to do. And it'll go through and remediate. Now, um, a good piece of information. If I had left that DV filter bind address uh, advanced property, when I applied this, it would have kicked back a failure. Not really descriptive on what the problem is. The way you fix those is you go, you SSH into the host, you pull up the VM kernel log, and you look at that. What I do is I put a tail, tail dash F, VM kernel log, which we talked about in the logging lesson, where it just kind of shows you any new lines that are added. So I tail the log, and then I go in and reapply the profile and watch for errors. And that's exactly what I did on the DV filter, and it came back with the right information. So we are now done. It checked compliance again. It's going to say it's not compliant because of the things that VMware needs to fix, my local SATA and my IP routes. But let's see if it actually did fix that stuff. So let's jump over to Mr. Bumblebee. Bumblebee. And we now have Data Store 2, and we have Data Store 3. And I bet if we go to networking, we will have a host profile demo port group. So, recap. Host profiles are a great way to have a reference host. It's a great way so that when you bring a host into the cluster, you're not spending an hour setting up NFS data stores, iSCSI LUNs, adding it to the distributed switch, tweaking your SSH settings, doing the other security policies, setting the syslog server, the DNS server, the NTP server, yada, yada, yada. The idea is you do it once and you push it down to your host. And it does save me time in my lab because I blow my lab boxes up all the time. And I don't want to have to reset all that stuff up either because I, I have to set all that up just like a production environment. So it makes my life a lot easier. But that's the purpose of host profiles. So back to the slides. And that's it for the lesson. So for the exam, uh, know how to do this. <laughs> I mean, it's obvious, right? But know the steps, know how to create a profile, use a reference host, edit a profile, uh, definitely know how to update an answer file, then do a remediate. Uh, keep in mind to do a remediate, you have to put the host in maintenance mode, which may take a little bit of time on the exam. So you may want to, if you got to do that, you may want to start it, go look at the next question and come back, but don't forget to come back. Um, and if there is some sort of a weird error, I don't think they're going to throw stuff like that on you at the exam, but it's possible. Remember to jump on the host and look at the VM kernel log. That's the quickest way to find uh, an answer to something like that. So that's it for this one. I look forward to seeing you on the next lesson.